What a beautiful thought that, that Lord, if we, if we are understanding who you are and who we are, if we are seeing the world in truth, then we have one thirst and we have one hunger. And Father, there is no question according to your word that uh, we are to thirst and hunger for your presence. We are to thirst and hunger for the reality of Jesus Christ in our lives. We are to thirst and hunger for the living presence of your Holy Spirit who draws us to Christ because this is the only way that we come to Christ is as you draw us and this is the only way we come to you is through your Son. So tonight, Father, uh, in the same prayer of John the Baptist, uh, Lord, would you cause um, myself and my own sinful heart and my own confused thoughts to be um, removed out of the way? And Lord, would you, you speak to us through your word in a way that clarifies to us who Jesus is to us, that we would worship him in spirit and truth tonight. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, I have to confess that at one of the lowest points in my life, um, there, there was a, a period of great confusion in my heart about who I am. I was already a pastor at that point. There was great confusion in my point about who, my identity, who I am before God, who I am before people. And uh, I understood at that, at that time that my uh, role as the pastor at the church that I was serving was in jeopardy. And it was leading me to a great, um, I think uh, Immanuel Kant would say, sort of a, an existential crisis. And uh, a counselor that I was visiting with and, and spending some time with at that point, uh, he asked me a question that uh, turned out to be the opening line of a conversation that became life-changing for me. He asked me this question. He said, Joe, what refreshes you? And then he said, and what gives you rest? And that turned out to be a life-changing thought for me as I began to understand that the things in my life that was causing me to be drained were the very things that I was wrapping my identity I, I wrapped myself up in an identity of what I do for a living and uh, my role, and that was killing me. And he taught me that to, to look a little uh, aside from that to see where I can find rest is in remembering who I am, not what I do for a living, but who I am as a child of God, and to lay my work aside for a period of time every week. And doesn't that sound like a good idea? to lay your work aside for a period of time every week? Wow, you know, that, that's, uh, that, that should be in the Bible. And, uh, but I, as a pastor, was certainly not practicing that. And it was having a very negative impact on my marriage with Heather and on my family and my, my role as a parent to my children. But what a good counselor. What gives you rest? What refreshes you? I love people. I love hanging around people. I'm a party animal <laughs> with a small p and a small a. And, uh, yeah, but I've chosen a work that very much involves people. So I find myself most of the time with people, uh, talking to people, praying with people, teaching people. I live with people. I'm around people a lot. And the, 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 the part that I, I'll, I'll have a very, very brief pity party here, just very brief. I'm an introvert. I am an introvert. I don't find rest by being around people. I find rest by being by myself. I, I'm rejuvenated when I get to be alone. And so being around people all the time is, um, well, that, 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 that can be draining. Are there any other introverts here who can identify with that? Oh, praise God. God loves you. God loves you more than extroverts. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Are there any extroverts here? Any extroverts? Yeah. yeah, there's a few of you. God loves you guys, and you already knew that, so I don't have to tell you. But we introverts, we often have a bit of a self, uh, uh, low self-esteem on that point. No, not really. So my question for you is, what drains you? I, I want you to be thinking about that a little bit. What drains you? Uh, is it your work? Is it being around people? Or is it being by yourself? Is it uh, your kids? Do your kids drain you? If you have kids, I, I'm sure you say yes. Uh, is it the demands of motherhood, the demands of fatherhood, the demands of responsibility and concern for your grandkids? What drains you? 
Is it business? Is it school? What drains you? And on the other hand, what refreshes you? Look with me at Mark chapter 6, verse 30. The heading, my first heading here is running on empty. Mark chapter 6, verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. I love how Mark sets up the story. It, it's a story clearly about the feeding of the 5,000. The heading in most of our Bible translations editions makes that clear. This is about the feeding of the 5,000. But uh, Mark begins with this verse. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. I love how Mark sets this up. In verse 30, the disciples come back from, this is, this is their first successful uh, ministry journey. Their, their travels as Jesus had sent them out to teach, to proclaim repentance, to do uh, works of healing, to cast out demons. Jesus had sent them out as apostles. And this is the first time they've come back and now they're reporting to Jesus all that they had done and taught. And you can almost hear them interrupting each other in excitement as they're reporting to Jesus. I imagined it in my head and I, I'm, I, this is totally uh, coloring outside the lines. I just, I, this is the conversation I heard in my head. I hear Peter saying, I had no idea I could teach like that. And, and John is saying, I touched a man and I watched him be healed right in front of my eyes. And James is saying, me too, me too. I, I did the same thing. I can hear that sort of conversation. And I can see in the text here that Mark shows us that there was a lot of busyness at this time as the disciples, the apostles came back to Jesus, they're reporting to him, and there's crowds, there's people coming and going and it's very busy, so that the next verse says they didn't even have time to eat. And I can imagine that what was first this excitement and success, the high of a thrill of doing something amazing and being part of that leads to a low of weariness. So it's important to notice what Jesus says next. Instead of like high fives all around and tips for a more effective methods of ministry next time and certainly instead of any plans to follow up on the new converts that the disciples might have been part of bringing to faith, Jesus wants his apostles to rest. He wants his apostles to rest. Look with me at the verses 31 and 32. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place. How do you like that? You know, Heather, I'd like to invite you and the rest of the family camping this summer. We're going to go to a desolate place. Um, attractive, isn't it? Yeah. Let's go back to the text. Verses 31, 32. He said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. They were running on empty. Mark comments that they were busy. He says they didn't have time to take time to eat. And this means, of course, that the disciples were hungry. What an appropriate setup for the feeding of the 5,000. And they're probably tired. So Jesus says, come away and rest a while. Rest a while. And I believe Jesus has a plan here to use those feelings in the disciples, those feelings in these 12 apostles, those feelings of hunger, those feelings of weariness. He has a plan to use those feelings to teach his apostles one of the most important lessons they were going to learn if they were going to truly for the rest of their lives be sent out to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was a critical lesson. So they get into the boat and they head for a quiet spot and Mark calls it a desolate place. It's an odd phrase, isn't it? The, a desolate place. And in the space of five verses, as you can see as Chris read that for us, Jesus calls it a desolate place. Mark describes it as a desolate place in his narrative. And the, the apostles call it a desolate place. This phrase gets emphasized. It's a desolate place. And the word desolate in Greek means empty or uninhabited. Well, you know, for an introvert, that actually sounds pretty good. I could, I could get used to that. Well, for periods of time anyway. It sounds pretty good. A little R&R, &R, a little peace and quiet, right? Amen? 
Amen. Uh, not exactly what the disciples were in for. Look at verses 33 and 34. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. See, it starts, many saw them, and then pretty quickly it includes a number from all the towns are running to get to the spot the boat is heading ahead of them. So this has become, a crowd has swelled. So much for a vacation. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. See, I, I think Jesus, being God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, I think Jesus knew exactly where he was headed. I think he knew exactly who was going to meet him there. Even before he suggested to the apostles, come away with me to a desolate place and rest a while. What do you think? It's a rhetorical question. You don't need to tell me what you think. But I think Jesus knows everything. I think there are times when the Father veils things from him in his, in his bodily life on earth. But I think he knows everything most of the time. So I think he knows about this. And I, again, I can, I, I can imagine the disciples from the boat watching the crowd running to, to get there ahead of them, to get to the spot they were heading ahead of them, and grumbling to each other, the disciples, so much for our day off. But again, I, I don't think Jesus has given up on his plans to teach his disciples about rest. Look with me again at verse 34, because I don't think he was doing something different here. I don't think he was changing to plan B. I think he had a bigger lesson in mind. Look at uh, verse 34. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them. The Greek word for compassion there is, has to do with your stomach. It's a, you know what an onomatopoeia is? It's one of those words that sounds like those, what it's trying to say, like bang, it sounds like a bang, and woof, it sounds like a woof. Splash, it sounds like a splash, right? This is another one of, is there another one? No? Uh, so uh, this is an onomatopoeic word. Uh, that this, this, this word in Greek for compassion is splachnizomai. That Jesus, Jesus' intestines went splach. It, it's, it's his gut was wrenched. That's exactly what the word is. It has to do with intestines. And he felt a wrenching in his gut, his intestines. He had an intestinal reaction to seeing the crowds that were, they were like sheep without a shepherd. He was moved deeply in his bowels, if you would. And it's, it's a funny idea for us, but it describes something of the compassion of our Savior. You can almost see him having a physical reaction as he sees the crowds. Verse 34, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Jesus saw the crowds as if they were sheep with no one to provide for them. What does a shepherd do for a sheep? He provides for them. He guards them. He guides them. He watches over them. He protects them. Jesus sees these crowds here with no one to provide for them. And for their part, I wonder what the crowd saw in Jesus that they ran to get there ahead of him. He sees them like sheep without a shepherd. What did they see in him? Someone to meet needs that they felt deeply I wonder what the crowd saw in him as they ran. But let's go back to the disciples. The second heading I have uh, on the screen is full of pride. So they were running on empty and now they're full of pride. Look at verses 35 to 38. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place and the hour is now late, send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? 
Go and see. And when they'd found out, they said five and two fish. See, Luke says in his uh, parallel account here, Luke says that Jesus had been teaching the crowds as he saw the crowds, that they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And Luke adds that he was teaching them about the kingdom of God. It would seem that somehow Jesus believes that what these sheep without a, these shepherdless sheep, what they need is something to do with the kingdom of God. And he begins to teach them many things regarding that. He believed the crowds somehow in the kingdom of God could find that one to provide for them, to protect them, to guide them and lead them, to feed them. Jesus believed that had to do with the message of the kingdom of God. And I think he also believed because of his original invitation to the disciples back in verse 31, come away with me to a desolate place and find rest. Rest for a while. I believe he believed and he knew that in the same message of the kingdom of God, the disciples might spot their shepherd. But the disciples weren't picking up what he was putting down. The disciples were not on the same frequency. They were not getting the message. The disciples' minds are on physical needs. The disciples' minds are not on what Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God, but very much in the domain of men. The disciples are concerned about their weariness. The disciples are concerned about their food, what they're going to eat. And so they bring this concern to Jesus. Send the crowds away. It's late. We're out in the middle of nowhere. Send them away to the surrounding villages so they can hunt up some food for themselves. But you see, this wasn't an emergency. Crowds can go a little while without food, especially if they, you know, really wanted to be there. Uh, during a, a stint when I was, um, I guess, about 18, I was in the Philippines, and, and the team that I was with, we were, I was with a Filipino team, and we were doing some disaster relief after a major earthquake and a series of aftershocks that went on for about a month. And uh, the team and I got stranded up in the mountains in the Philippines, northern Philippines, and we were stranded. The, her, the, the uh, earthquake had wiped out all the roads in the air, mountainous area where we were, and there was a, a very nasty hurricane that kept us uh, kind of um, locked down so it was not, not safe to travel at all, not even safe to hike in those mountains because of threat of mudslides and whatnot. So we were stranded in this little tiny village of about 50 people with no food. We had no food for several days and we had tons and tons and tons of water. It was coming down all the time. So we had lots and lots of water, but we had no food for several days. And you can imagine our relief when the, the storm broke and the American army dropped off by their helicopters. They dropped off uh, large, um, I don't know what you call them, kind of crates, their packages, pallets, pallets maybe, of um, sardines in tomato sauce with sacks of rice. I tell you, still today, the finest meal you can enjoy is steamed rice with sardines and tomato sauce. It's absolutely divine. Nothing will ever taste better. You can, you can just take my word for it. Uh, absolutely the finest meal possible for a human to enjoy. Sardines and tomato sauce and steamed rice. But you see, the point there is that when, when we got those supplies, we were actually doing okay. We were tired, but we were doing okay. This was not an emergency when the disciples said, send the crowds away to get food. They hadn't even been out a whole day yet. So the disciples, what their minds are on is not on the kingdom of God and the things that Jesus is, te Jesus is teaching to them. I think the problem here for the disciples is that they believe that the most serious hunger is for food. They believe that the bigger needs in life are physical. And they're worried that they did not have what was required to take care of the crowds. And you know something? They were absolutely right. They did not have what was required to take care of the crowds. Think about it. In verse 30, back to verse 30. When the disciples come back and report to Jesus from their exciting and their successful ministry trip, casting out demons, healing the sick, and teaching people in towns around Galilee, how did they describe their experiences to Jesus? Look at the words. How did they ex describe their experiences to Jesus? What did they tell Jesus? Anyone? Pardon? They told Jesus all that they had done. 
and e even taught. They told Jesus all that they had done and what they had taught. See, it's human nature, I think, to um, think that when we do something wonderful, it must be because of us. I'm that wonderful. Don't we love that thought? Am I the only one? No, we all love that thought. Thank you. I see that hand. But that's not the way it is in the kingdom of God. See, the disciples didn't cast out demons on their own authority. In Mark chapter 6, verse 7, it says, Jesus gave them authority over the demons. And the disciples uh, certainly didn't heal sickness and diseases on their own power. Uh, that's ridiculous. And certainly the disciples didn't even teach from what they had in their own hearts and minds. Their teaching didn't come from themselves. Jesus, in Mar again in Mark 6, verse 7, he sends them out and he told them what to preach. Preach a, a gospel of repentance. Proclaim repentance. What the disciples say here, and Mark doesn't give us their words, he just summarizes it. They told Jesus all that they had done and taught. What the disciples are focusing on here is very different from what they focused on 20 or 30 years later. Because if you read the epistles of the New Testament, if you read the rest of the New Testament, what you get is very different sounding apostles to verse 30. In verse 30, it's all that we had done and all that we had taught. And later on, you know, I, I did some searching on my Bible software and I found that over 65 times, later on in the rest of the letters of the New Testament, the rest of the books of the New Testament, the disciples use phrases like, in Christ Jesus, or by the power of God, or according to the will of God, or by the power of the Holy Spirit. Over 65 times in the few books that remain in the New Testament. They were very different men later on than they were in verse 30, and I think that's clear. And I think this is because deep down they thought that Jesus had chosen them at this time because of something special they had to offer. There's a great Casting Crown song which talks about the relief that comes from knowing that, and I've just forgotten the line now. Does anyone know it? Um, it's a relief that comes from knowing that God didn't need me, but he's using me. He's called me to use me. He certainly doesn't need me, but he's chosen me to use me. Oh, is that ever a relief? There's nothing, my friends, in us that God needs. There's nothing special about us for which he calls us. He calls us to make us special, not the other way around. And Jesus wants these apostles to learn this, to learn what rest is, to learn where power comes from, that to, to change the way of thinking because right now they believe their ministry to people depended at least or in part in what they had to give, what they had to offer. And Jesus is still teaching them what real rest is, where real rest can be found. And it's not in that kind of sense of identity or sense of purpose. He was about to teach them that none of it depends on us. That real rest only comes from Jesus. And that's such an obvious statement from Christians who believe it's true, but we don't actually live like it's true. If you could see my week this week, you would know Joe doesn't live like this is true. And if I could see your week this week, I'd wager I would say you don't live like it's true either. He wants to teach us where rest comes from, that our deepest hungers can be found and filled only in Jesus. It can't be found or filled with food. Our deepest hunger cannot be filled with food. Our pride stands in the way of receiving what the shepherd wants to give his desperate flock. Do you agree with that? Our pride stands in the way? See, many years later, Peter... One of these apostles that came back excited like to Jesus, and I think he's the one saying something like, I never knew I could teach like that. Who knows whether he said it or not. But later on, years later, he writes this in 1 Peter 5, 5. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And the Greek words there again are uh, um, 
They're, they're words of, of uh, height and lowliness. God opposes those who exalt themselves and lift themselves up. He, he opposes them, but he gives grace and he lifts up those who lower themselves. It's a beautiful picture. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humility is an attitude of dependency. Humility is an attitude of trust. Humility is an attitude of reliance. It is the opposite to self-sufficiency. It is the opposite to independence. It is the opposite to pride. Just look how Jesus shows the disciples. Look, look at the next verses, how Jesus shows the disciples how truly poor they are in order to show them how magnificently rich he is. Look at verse 37. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall, shall we go and buy 200 denarii? That's 200 days wages. Two thirds of a year's income just about. Shall we go and spend that kind of money on bread and give it to these crowds to eat? See, finally... Finally, they admit that they're poor. The disciples estimate it's going to cost 200 days wages to feed the crowd this size. And Jesus here was not making a mistake. He, he hadn't slipped up and misunderstood or mis, what's the, wrongly estimated what their resources were and whether or not they could take care of the crowd. This was not bad planning on Jesus' part. This was Jesus helping the disciples to see that there is no way on earth they could meet the physical needs of this crowd. They were poor and needy themselves. And if that's true, how in the world could they ever think they could begin to touch the spiritual needs of a crowd like this? How could they ever become apostles of the kingdom of God if they did not learn this lesson? Look at verse 38. And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And, and it's not how many loaves can, you, loaves can you find in the crowd. It's how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they'd found out, they said five and two fish. You see, I think that was their lunch. I think that was what they planned to eat once they got to the desolate place away from the crowds with which they were busy because they had no leisure even to eat. I think this is what they packed. Something like that. And now Jesus is asking them to share it. I don't think they like that idea. But finally, they come back and they say five and two fish. And they admit what they should have acknowledged back in verse 30, that they are poor. When they had come back telling Jesus about what they had done, now they admit that they've got nothing to feed the crowds. They've got nothing at all with which to serve. They admit that they're poor. And now Jesus shows them his glory. That's the only word I could think of for this next phase in the passage. Jesus shows them his glory. Now Jesus shows them his wealth. He outwardly manifests what is eternally and internally true of the Son of God. He points them here to the only shepherd that can give true rest and true food. See that empty feeling that we feel when we are hungry? When we are tired, when we're lonely, that void that we feel when we're not really hungry but we eat anyway, surely I'm not the only one. That void that we feel when we're not really alone but we are lonely anyway, that void that we feel when we're not really tired but we just want to go back to bed. What is that empty feeling for? When we choose sin, as if it can fill our need, and as if sin, the selfish desires our heart craves for, as if somehow earthly things can satisfy our souls, instead of the one who created everything on earth. When we choose sin, that empty feeling is meant to bring us to our knees, 
to drive us to Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said this, and I have no idea where it's from, except I saw it on Facebook, so I presume it's true. (laughs) Spurgeon must have said it. It was from his own personal Facebook account. And Spurgeon said this, I've learned to kiss the wave that drives me to the rock of ages. Oh, I love that. Don't waste that empty feeling. John Piper wrote a little book one time. He said, don't waste your cancer. It's the same idea. Don't waste that empty feeling. Let's use this feeling of emptiness to carry us to look for rest in Jesus Christ. So the disciples, really, the lesson that they're learning here is and they eventually they do learn this as they, they come and they say, Lord, all I've got is this little bit of bread and little bit of fish. Lord, for what you're asking of me, Lord, I've got nothing. I've, I've, I'm, I'm broke, Lord. I'm absolutely poor. I've got nothing. My hands are empty. My pockets are empty. My heart is empty. I've got nothing. What do I give? In your name, I don't have it in me. And I don't know this for sure, but I would, I would wager, if, if we had any way of knowing, I would wager this, that at that moment, when the disciples came back to Jesus and they said, five and two fish, that Jesus looked on them and with love on his face, he smiled at them. I would wager that. My last heading is satisfied in Jesus. Look at verses 39 and 40. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. Jesus commanded the crowds of 5,000 men, and some scholars will say that this is 5,000 men, and who knows how many women and children there were. I don't know for sure about that, but at least it's a big crowd. I don't think it really matters a whole lot whether it's 12,000 or 5,000. You can't feed 5,000 people with, you know, five loaves and two fish anyway, so the number is insignificant. It's an incredible miracle, right? But Jesus commands the crowd to sit. And this word commands is the same word that the Apostle Paul uses in his letter to Philemon, the slave owner Philemon, when Paul says, I am bold enough to command you to do what is required. This is the same word Jesus uses when, Mark uses when he says, Jesus commanded the crowd to sit on the green grass. So Jesus stands up, and it must have been with a loud and bold voice if he's heard by 5,000 people and obeyed. He stands up and uses his authority and says, Sit down! And they sat down in obedience, and it's, it's a posture of being ready to receive, of not doing anything. It's a posture of being ready to see what he's going to do for you as they sit in groups of 50 and 100. And I wonder, in this this laying themselves out, ready for some kind of feast, I wonder where they thought the food was going to come from. But you see, what Mark shows us here is the details in this passage, the details Mark gives us here that aren't found in Matthew or Luke, some of these details, these details show us that this isn't for Mark just another miracle to show Jesus' power. This isn't just like one of the other string of miracles by which Mark is showing that Jesus has power and authority over sickness and disease and nature and demons and even sin and death. This isn't just another one of the miracles to demonstrate his power. This is different from Mark. This isn't really about the miracle at all. This is about who Jesus Christ is. Jesus is showing the crowds and the disciples because he still wants them to find that little rest. He's showing the crowds and his followers that he is God the provider. In the Hebrew, Yahweh Yireh, which we pronounce very often because of the King James Bible, Jehovah Jireh. This is who Jesus is. And Mark shows this in a few details. Look at them with me. First, Mark shows that Jesus grouped the crowds into 50s and 100s. And this didn't just make it easier to estimate that there were 5,000 people there, 5,000 men there. 
This, in fact, calls to mind the way Moses organized Israel at Aaron's advice into similar groups just before God gave them the Ten Commandments and entered into a covenant with the nation. That's in Exodus 18.21. And then the way Jesus makes them sit down on the green grass for a feast It calls to mind the way that David lovingly praises the great shepherd, Yahweh, God of Israel, and he says, Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Psalm 23, 1-3. And did you see the parallels with the green grass? Jesus told them to sit on the green grass. And the parallels with, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul with the provision of needs and rest that Jesus was teaching. When the Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and Jesus commands them to sit on the green grass. Furthermore, Mark said Jesus had compassion Remember that? He had compassion. Splachnizomai. His, he had a gut-wrenching reaction. And I hope that gut-wrenching thing and, and the intestinal thing isn't what you take home from this sermon. <laughs> but Mark showed that Jesus had compassion because he saw the people were like sheep without a shepherd. And when he saw that, don't mistake this, that he was seeing that they were like people without God. That's what he saw. Jesus then looks up to his father. He takes the banquet feast. He looks up to his father. And he blesses it. He looks up to his father and he got ready to reveal himself. To show his glory as the great shepherd of Israel. In the flesh. And before we read the rest of this passage, just consider one more major clue. That Mark uses to show us who Jesus is. And it's about the bread. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, verse 9. We'll read 9 to 15 and also verse 35. Exodus 16, verse 9. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness. The Greek translation says the desolate places. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat. And in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quail came up and covered the camp. And in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to other in Hebrew, Ma'ana, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Verse 10 in Exodus 16. Verse 10 says that the people looked toward the wilderness. And the Greek translation again, the desolate place. And behold, the glory of the Lord appeared. Mark is writing this as if to call to mind this very incident that we would see that in the wilderness, in the desolate place, the glory of the Lord appeared in Jesus Christ. Jesus was about to show the crowd his glory, God in the flesh. Listen again to Exodus 16, verse 12. I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel say to them, at twilight, the disciple says, the hour is late, send the crowds away. The Lord says in Exodus 16, 12, Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, 
and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. And then you shall know, and this is the whole point, then you shall know that I am the Lord, your God. God told them that they would eat meat and bread at twilight and that they would know I am Yahweh. I am the Lord your God. Now let's read the rest of this passage in Mark 6. Going from verse 41. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. A miracle worker might be able to feed us and meet our felt needs. Possibly we could find someone like that to tantalize us, to excite us about the powerful things he might do. He might be able to excite us and, and meet some of our felt needs and heal our sicknesses and diseases and, and maybe even he could do things that make us wealthy. A miracle worker might be able to do some things like that. But only God, only I am, only the Lord your God can meet the needs of the body and the soul. Only he can do this. One of my study Bibles says this, that understanding of the eternal purposes, the kingdom of God, understanding of the eternal purposes of Christ's provision, what he provides for us, this understanding creates a radical transformation of the follower in terms of his or her attitude toward work, career, challenge, opposition, deprivation, sacrifice, future, and life itself. Can I read that again for you? Understanding of the eternal purposes of Christ's provision creates a radical transformation of the follower in terms of his or her attitude toward work, career, challenge, opposition, deprivation, sacrifice, future, and life itself. A radical transformation that comes from knowing who Jesus is, that he is Yahweh, the provider of all of our deepest needs. My friends, let's be that kind of radically transformed church. Let's be a radically transformed people. Let's be radically transformed in our marriages, in our work, in our families, in our schools. Let's be radically transformed as individuals. Amen? Is it just the foolish preacher saying this? Is it a pipe dream? Or is it the power of God? Let, let's, let's do what the disciples did when Jesus said, come out by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. Let's, let's do what they had to do in that moment. Let's leave behind some of the things that we tend to rely on. Let's leave behind some of the things that we fill ourselves up with. Let's leave behind some of the ways that we medicate that void in our soul. And you know what I'm talking about. Let's leave behind some of these ways that we try to meet our own needs and satisfy the hunger in our own hearts. Let's use that empty feeling to run to Jesus, to run ahead and meet him. Let's use that empty feeling to meet with him where he is and learn from him about the kingdom of God and what it means to us that the Son of God died on a cross for our sins so that we are free and we, he has made us a people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession forever. We are that to him. Let's learn from him about this. Let's not be proud and let's not try to serve him while we're also relying on ourselves and somehow doing both. It doesn't work. 
we're running on empty that way. Let's admit our poverty, our brokenness to him and to each other. Let's admit our thirst and our hunger that only God can meet. And let's look into the empty places to see. Behold, the glory of God appeared. Let us see the glory of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And let's learn that the things that he gives us and the food that he feeds us is to teach us to be satisfied not with bread, not with fish, not with quail, not with manna, but with the presence of God in the face of Jesus Christ for us. That he is our God. Let's learn to be satisfied in that, that we trust him, that we love him, and that we follow him. Amen? And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Father, I pray that this is true tonight, that Lord, because of the power of your word, I pray that you will begin to accomplish this in our hearts. Lord, wean us from those things that we use to feed our own souls and those things that leave us hungry again and again and again. Call us away from the things, Lord, that lead us away from you. Let us leave those things behind. Let us run, Lord, with excitement and zeal to meet with you. Let us sit at your feet at your command on the green grass and see that you are our shepherd and soak up the gospel that your word teaches us, the good news. Lead us beside still waters and restore our souls, Lord, and radically transform us. I pray this because of the power and the promise of the word of God. I pray this because of the presence of Jesus Christ and in his name. Amen.